Well, friends, let us resume the public worship of God, and we sing together in the first verse of Psalm 148. Psalm 148, the first verse of the psalm, and we're going to sing from verse 5 down to 14, the end of the psalm, a psalm that calls us to praise the Lord and to see something of his glory and his majesty. The whole of creation is called, everything that's there in, in creation is called to join, as it were, one great choir of song and praise. <clears throat> from verse 5. Let all the creatures praise the name of our almighty Lord.
Eternal Lord, we have heard ourselves included in those summoned to praise God. And we pray tonight for the leading of God's Spirit <clears throat> so that we will be able to do so in a way that would be God-honoring and to our benefit. We crave, O oh Lord, the leading and presence of the Spirit in every part of our worship so that we will be instructed in the things of God, that we will be led to consider the Word of God and how it applies to ourselves. And so we will find it speaking to our own hearts this Lord's Day evening. Do not leave us to our own devices. Do not leave us to find our own way as best we can. But as we draw near, may the Lord draw near to us, whoever we are and whatever our circumstances, whether we are very young or whether we are a good deal older, whether we are the Lord's trusting in him or whether we are yet unable to say that for ourselves, that we would find each one of us that our hearts are led to the throne room of God in worship and in expectation. <clears throat> Forgive us our sins. And they are too many to number, and we are not called to number them in public in any case. But they are well known to the breaches of both tables of the law. Some of them are worse than others. We know that every one of them deserves God's wrath and curse, both in this world and in the world to come. And supposing there were but one sin on our account, and that would be enough for our ruin. But in reality, there is a number that cannot be numbered. We give thanks tonight for Christ, for his shed blood, and for the reality that there is a name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. And there's only one name. The glory belongs exclusively to him. Keep us from trying to put our own name where Christ's name belongs, or any other name for that matter. His name is Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. We pray again for our homes and families, again for our presbytery and the congregations within it, and the wider work of the denomination. We pray for our home mission worker as he goes about in evangelism in different parts of the country. And indeed, we pray for him as we look forward to having him with ourselves in the not too distant future. We even now preparing ground in hearts and souls for the seed that will then be sown. We pray, Lord, for blessing upon the work of the church up and down our country. Beyond our borders, uh, the, we pray for all who love Christ in truth and in sincerity, and who preach Christ and him crucified. We have much to concern us about the state of the visible church. There's much that concerns us and casts us down. But uh, we must not forget that the Lord reigns and that uh, the Lord is able in a moment to turn the tide. We pray, Lord, that we would be humbled and made truly penitent. For we read already today of Saul and his prayers, but a condition of answered prayer is obedience. Give us obedient hearts so that we will not be like Saul, merely naming the name of God when it suits us but abandoning him when it doesn't, that we would be truly wedded to Christ in our own experience. We pray again, Lord, for the government, the civil structures of life. We do pray that it would be fashioned in a more godly way, and that indeed the opposition to the things of Christ, which seems to rise constantly, it would yet be quelled by a reviving work of God's Spirit. We pray for the church persecuted, 
many parts of the world, that they would see that their persecution is not in vain, and that even in this, the Lord has his own purposes, that they would stand firm by God's grace, and that their witness would be a savor of Christ to those who are most viciously opposed to them. We pray, Lord, for wisdom in such circumstances, and indeed wisdom in our own circumstances. When we come up against difficulties and obstacles, we uh, pray that we would not rush into our own solutions, but that we would be more inclined to wait on the Lord and to follow the principles of his word more diligently than we have done many at a time. Receive us then, Lord, as we come. Receive our worship as we bring it. It is as unclean as we are, but we offer it in Christ's name. He is our great high priest, and he cleanses what we bring. And we pray that he would do so this evening. Be pleased, Lord, to remember those that we must bring with special needs. Some who are unwell, others bereaved, and we have heard today of deaths within our own circles and within our own community here. We pray, Lord, for those who mourn. And we are thankful that at such times we can reflect in the Lord's people that we do not mourn as those without hope. That indeed the daughter of the king, all glorious is within, and with embroideries of gold, her garments wrought have been. Those who know Christ, they are brought to the king in robes of needle wrought, and they have never been fuller or happier than they are in glory. But we are here below. Remember those whose hearts are sore and uh, who whose uh, spirits are heavy. Remember, Lord, those with uh, pressing medical issues, and we know that among them are ministers of the gospel and even ministers of the gospel locally as well. We pray, Lord, for all such, and we pray that in hard providences there might be a, a greater shaping and fashioning as there must be of all of us, under the hand of God. There's a reason for everything. And in the weaver's skillful hands, the dark threads are as needful as the gold ones in the pattern he has planned. Cover our sin now and receive us freely. And assist us and guard us for Jesus' sake. Amen. <coughs> I'm going to read now in the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 4. Acts of the Apostles in chapter 4. <clears throat> I'll read from the beginning of the chapter. <clears throat> Remember, we're taking up our reading at that point in the narrative where Peter and John have been instrumental in the healing of the crippled beggar and a crowd has gathered and Christ, uh, Peter has been preaching to them of the Lord Jesus. And as they spake to the people, <clears throat> the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold till the next day, for it was now even time. Albeit uh, many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, they were leading dignitaries in the <clears throat> Jewish hierarchy of the day. We were able to identify who all of these people were. 
and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. In other words, the Sanhedrin was called. When they had set them in the midst, they asked them, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said to them, Ye rulers of Israel, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, <clears throat> by what means he is made known, whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is a stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And so on we trust the Lord to follow with his blessing that reading of his word. <clears throat> We're going to sing now in Psalm 119. Psalm 119, and we'll sing from verse 41. We'll sing the whole of this section. You notice in verse 46, he says, I'll speak thy word to kings, and I with shame will not be moved. Now, Peter isn't speaking to kings, but he's speaking to the authorities. And he's not moved. He's not embarrassed at all. Name the name of Christ. 41 through 48, that thy sweet mercies also come. Let thy sweet mercies also come. And
seek the Lord's light on his own word and we turn to that word now and to that chapter that we read the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 4 we read at the beginning as they speak to the people the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them being grieved that they taught the people preach through Jesus the resurrection from the dead and they laid hands on them and put them on hold until the next day, for it was now even tide. I was just checking that I have this on. <clears throat> Chapter 4, um, and at the beginning there, as they spake to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people, and so on. Well, you remember um, last Lord's Day, we came to the close of chapter 3. Now, <clears throat> chapter 3 is a it's a remarkable chapter. Our familiarity with it shouldn't cause us to uh, begin to take it for granted. It opens with the healing of the crippled beggar. And that leads, of course, to a crowd gathering. And Peter preaches to the crowd. Now, the events that we have here in chapter 4 follow on immediately. And here we're given an account, actually, of the first act of persecution of the Christian church. The first act of persecution against the Christian church. And it didn't take long. In coming. The crowd were still gathered, listening to Peter, and suddenly you would see, if you were there, an official looking group arriving. They're looking very serious, very stern. They mean business. And if you knew the people, you would recognize who some of them were. The temple guard are there. And among them also some of the priests, the priestly order, and there were various degrees and seniority among the priesthood. Well, it's some of them who are there. And also the group known as the Sadducees. And we'll see in a moment exactly who they were. They come, they make their way through the crowd, and they pounce on Peter and John, and they arrest them. They arrest them. And it appears that they also arrested the crippled beggar, because in verse 14, he is with them when they have to appear before the Sanhedrin. It's absolutely astonishing. What a, what a day he was having. He began the day as a crippled beggar. By the end of the afternoon, he was healed of his cripple 
uh, problem, he was healed of his lameness. And by the end of the day, he's in prison. I'll come back to that just later on as well. But I want to focus <clears throat> on three things this evening, and I'm just going to follow the narrative through fairly simply, I, I, I hope. I want us to focus, first of all, on the preaching that led to the persecution. Then we'll look at the persecution itself. And thirdly, the response to that persecution. But we have to begin with the root cause, the preaching that led up to this arrest. Now it's summed up for us in verse two that Peter and John preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now that's just a very short summary of what they were engaged in. It would have included Peter explaining to them about the death of Christ, which had happened just weeks before. It was all very fresh in their memory. He would have told them once again that Christ's death was not an ordinary death or even a tragedy, that it was a death that had come about by the determinate counsel of God, that he had died as a substitute for sinners, that he had risen again from the dead, had been seen of several hundred witnesses who were prepared to testify to that, and then after a period of some six weeks, had ascended again to the right hand of God in heaven. Basic Christian doctrine, the sort of thing we, we repeat here again and again, week in and week out. But of course, these truths were extremely offensive to the authorities. The group of men who turn up to arrest uh, the apostles were among the most self-righteous group of men that walked the earth. And they are extremely annoyed, to put it mildly, at the preaching that was going on. And they are determined to nip this whole thing in the bud. They had no interest in what Peter was preaching. Because in their own eyes, they had no need of a savior. And they had no time for any suggestion of a savior. A savior who would carry the weight of their sin who would deal with their guilt and with their condemnation. Well, as far as they were concerned, they had no sin to carry. And it was extremely offensive in their ears. And it's still offensive in the ears of many people. And for all I know, and as I said this morning, I have no idea who listens in and tunes in, for all I know, maybe even you yourself find it a hard doctrine. But whether they liked it or not, this is what they got. And this is what they got as well, when after their arrest, they bring Peter and John and the, and the lame man, or the no longer lame man, and they have him set in the midst. And as we'll see in a moment, they're given an opportunity to recant and to backtrack and to modify things. But not a bit of it. It's the same message that Peter gives the authorities after the arrest. It's unchanged and it's undiluted. In verse 12, for instance, he tells them that they needed to be saved. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. He's, he's driving this point home, you see. Just in case they didn't catch what he said when he was speaking to the crowd. He's reiterating again this absolute need of salvation. That's why Christ came, he said. That's why he died on the cross. 
to save his people from their sins, from the power of sin. We saw this morning in the life of King Saul, the power of sin and the way the power of sin drove him further and further in the wrong direction. Christ comes to break that power, to set his people free. And also to save them from the penalty and the punishment and the curse that comes with their sin by taking it, of course, onto himself. Whether they believed what the apostles said or not, and for the greater part, they certainly did not, whether they saw it or not, this is the message that Peter's going to give them. And it's the constant message of the Bible. Peter directs them to Christ in verse 12. But Christ is only of meaning to us if we need a savior. Otherwise, Matthew 1, 21 means nothing. That he is called Jesus because he came to save his people from their sins. You see, the two things are so welded together. There is none other name, says Peter. Under heaven. Now, why does he say name there? Why does he say there is none other name? Well, the name stands for a person, really. And Jesus' name, Jesus' titles tell us what he is and tell us what he does. A doctor, you know what a doctor does. If somebody says to you, I'm a doctor, you know what they do. You know what they're about. Somebody says to you, you're a teacher. You know what they do and you know what they're about. Well, he is called Jesus, and that immediately tells us he's a savior. His name, his title, reflects our need. Now, I could go on and on on the preaching that led up to the persecution, but I, I, I don't want to say any more about that just now. Because secondly, I want to consider the persecution itself. Now, I don't think persecution is too strong a word for it. It was real persecution. And there are four things I want us to notice <clears throat> about this persecution. First of all, it was unreasonable. It was unreasonable. Why is there all this fuss about what Peter and James are saying and doing? Why is there this hostility? Why does it need an armed guard to turn up and an emergency meeting of the Sanhedrin to be called? You could understand the arrest of Peter and John if they were causing trouble. If they'd been standing in the temple and encouraging the crowds to rebel against the authorities. If they were speaking in a way that would have created a, a riot that would have ended up in who knows what. They weren't doing anything of the sort. You could understand the fuss if they had hurt somebody, if they'd done a bad thing, if they had, let's put it on its head, if they had crippled the man, you might understand why they're arrested. But they hadn't crippled the man. They had healed the crippled man. And yet, they are arrested. It's akin. I was thinking of this earlier. It's akin maybe to a little old shed. That nobody uses and has nothing in it. Halfway down a croft somewhere. Catching fire. And it's akin to all the emergency services being called out. You've got the police and you've got half a dozen fire brigades and three ambulances and you've got uh, the, the coast guards and you've got a, a helicopter overhead. 
I said, oh, shit, that burned. There was nothing in it. There was nobody in it. It was full of woodworm and dry rot anyway. Say, what a fuss. Well, the situation we have here is a little like that. It was the response is completely unreasonable. It's entirely out of proportion to what had happened. And isn't it interesting? There's not a word of happiness on the part of the authorities that the crippled man was healed. You would think they'd be delighted. They're not delighted. They're everything but delighted. I'm afraid the sad truth is that they would rather that he was still a crippled beggar than to have him healed by the power of Christ. They didn't care about the crippled beggar. And they rather wish he was still a crippled beggar. And all of this proves surely, surely, that behind all of this opposition, there is a desperately strong satanic force. Satan was out in force in Jerusalem. He sees a serious threat to his kingdom. And he calls out his forces. And he incites these men to overreact in an unreasonable way to arrest the apostles and arrest the other poor man with them and clap them in irons overnight. Behind it all, that is an opposition. And this is the only thing that really does explain the force of the opposition. An opposition to the gospel of Christ because such preaching must be closed down and silenced as quickly as possible. It's unreasonable. It's what the late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones used to call the irrationality of unbelief. Unbelief likes to present itself as very rational. The truth is it's completely irrational. Sin is irrational. And our falling into sin is evidence of our irrationality. And their response is irrational. A man has been healed. And they, they don't even notice that. It was unreasonable. Now, I don't know if you've ever felt anything like this yourself. Where a response to Christian witness has provoked such an unreasonable response that you don't know where it came from. Well, at the end of the day, <clears throat> I think we have a fairly good idea of where it comes from. Satan is not asleep, friends. Mm -hmm. And he is going about like a roaring lion and he will shut things down if he can. And if there is the slightest threat to his kingdom, he pulls out all the stops. But let's turn that coin over. And let's ask ourselves, does your witness 
attract any opposition. Now, I'm not saying you should go out to attract opposition. That's not wise. But that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, does your witness attract opposition? Or is it so anemic that nobody notices? There's a, a massive challenge there for all of us. I've told you umpteen times the story of the young fellow from the Highlands who was converted and who went away to work in one of the cities. And he was away for months and he came home. And he went to visit the minister. The minister went to visit him. I don't know. And the minister said to him, how are you getting on in your workplace as a Christian? Oh, fine, he said. I don't think anybody there knows that I am a Christian. Are we as ready as Peter and John were to face opposition? The fear of man, my friend, brings a snare, and we'll see more of that in a minute. The persecution was unreasonable, but I want us to notice secondly, <coughs> excuse me, that it was also unnatural. Now, what do I mean? What I mean is this. It brought together different groups that in normal circumstances were at each other's throats. They would have nothing to do with each other. Verse 1, I, also, I already mentioned the Sadducees. Now, who were the Sadducees anyway? Well, the Sadducees were the skeptics of their day. They were attached to the religious life of Israel. But there wasn't a spark of religious life in their souls. They were very skeptical. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe in angels. Their, their views even on the soul and spiritual things were, were extremely weak. You know, we sometimes think that theological liberalism was born in the 20th century. And that before then there was nothing like that. Always been there. Different names perhaps, but always been there. The Sadducees were the sort of people, if they were around today, they were the sort of people who would be interviewed on the media and they would, they would cast doubt on the central truths of the, of, 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 of the Christian faith. And the interviewer would ask them, well, what do your group believe about the resurrection? Say, oh, well, we, we think that's now been disproved and nobody believes in the resurrection. And what about angels? Oh, no, that's, that's an Old Testament idea. That's the Sadducees for you in a nutshell. They're still in operation. But they're there along with the priests. Now the priests, for whatever failings they had, they were at least very orthodox, theologically. They didn't believe any of that nonsense that the Sadducees believed. They were opposed to it tooth and nail. And in any other setting, these two groups wouldn't have agreed on anything. They're able to call a truce when it comes to Christ. Because my enemy's enemy is my friend. <clears throat> this is not the first time this has happened in the Gospels. You have the same with Pilate and Herod. They, they become friends in the midst of their opposition to Christ. And surely, and I, I, I don't want to weary you with this point, but surely this is another thread of evidence that there are sinister forces at work here in Acts 4. So that various groups are able to lay down their arms and unite in opposition to each other. And so it shouldn't surprise us, friends, and I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but I better make the point in case I forget it later. It shouldn't surprise us when we see the same thing happening in our own society. 
And when we see groups of people who apparently have very little in common, finding common ground in their opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you watch it. You'll see it. You'll see it with your own eyes. Various lobby groups who are poles apart. But they call a truce on one issue. Christ Jesus. The persecution was unreasonable. It was unnatural in the sense that it defied the ordinary course of things. And thirdly, it was unchanging. It's unchanging. Now, I touched on that a moment ago, but I want to say more about it. This is the first act of persecution of the New Testament church. And although 2,000 years have passed, as I've been hinting for the last few minutes, there's an uncanny similarity to the circumstances of our own day. Not much has changed. Just as the authorities here in Acts 4 would have rather that this man had stayed a cripple than be healed by the power of Christ, there are still those. And they would rather that men and women remained in a broken, sinful state than be healed and saved by the power of Christ. There's an enmity in the human heart to Christ and to the gospel that is still unreasonable and can only be explained by going back to the root of it all. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God Neither indeed can be a carnal mind. Now, I could multiply examples of this, but I don't want to weary you. And I'll give you just one. And I, it's come up a couple of times in the last few years. You'll read sometimes of Christians who go into prisons. Maybe as prison visitors or maybe as chaplains, full-time chaplains. And they go in with the gospel. And often they are interfered with and stopped. Now, is that because the prisoners have become worse? No. Amazingly enough, some of the prisoners are transformed. They hear the gospel, explain to them. Some of them are truly and wonderfully converted. And some of the most violent and hideous people in the prison system are transformed. But as soon as it becomes obvious that this is through the power of Christ, the visits are curtailed. And the work has stopped. Mm -hmm. Now there's been example after example of this. In the past couple of years. And it would leave you scratching your head. If you didn't remember Acts 4. And if you didn't realize. That there's more to this opposition. Than meets the eye. And you know, you still get strange and unexpected coalitions against Christ and his gospel. Now, friends, I'm not here as a victim looking for sympathy. 
because we're hard done by. I'm just stating the facts. And in this country, we aren't hard done by. I've been to places where they are. I'm just stating the facts. And in any case, although the persecution and the opposition was unreasonable and unnatural and unchanging, you know something else? It's unsuccessful. It's unsuccessful. No doubt they hoped that Peter and John would get the fright of their lives. We'll put the frighteners on. We'll gather the whole Sanhedrin. We'll question them gravely. And this will be it. Well, if they hope to intimidate them into silence and to turn the crowd against them, their efforts were spectacularly unsuccessful. Verse 3. They laid hands on them, put them in hold till the next day, for it was evening. Verse 4. How be it? How be it? How be it what? How be it many of them which heard the word believed? Oh, 20, 30 maybe. And the number of them, about 5,000. Friend, if you're going to fight against God, you might as well know you're not going to succeed. A few days earlier at Pentecost, 3,000 were converted. Now another 5,000. That's 8,000 new believers in a few days. Now, I don't know. I don't know. I might be wrong. And if you, you can think of an example, please tell me. I don't know of any such period of blessing since then. We've seen thousands converted in periods of revival, but I don't think there's been this sort of number. It certainly happened very rarely. So it's really right to call this a revival. It was a revival of the Old Testament church, which had lain dead and stagnant, and the, the Spirit of the Lord has breathed in a remarkable way. And at least 8,000 people have come to know the Lord. The, the whole situation was transformed. But the point is this. He is able to do it. Opposition is always going to be unsuccessful in the long run. And sometimes it's even unsuccessful in the short run. We saw that last night with Garner, didn't we? You remember the way he was talking about um, Haman, who had a plan to destroy the witness of God's people. And if ever a plan went wrong, it was Haman's. You see, Christ has already defeated the serpent. It's not a case of Christ trying to fight against the forces of darkness at every turn. The way you and I might try to put out a fire. You know the way it is when you try to put out a fire. You have been involved in a, in, a, in a moor fire. Even on a very small scale. It's, it's terribly difficult. You put it out and it starts again behind you. Well, that's not the way that the Lord is. He's not desperately trying to put out. He's already put it out. Christ is victor. He has defeated the serpent. He is king of kings and lord of lords tonight, right now. Oh, Satan has many arrows in his sling. And we saw that this morning with poor Saul. 
But let's not fall into the trap of thinking that this is a battle between two equals whose outcome is uncertain. It's everything but. So the preaching that led to the persecution and the persecution is that one last thing, the response to the persecution. Now, I'm going to say more about that if we're spared in the next couple of weeks. But I want to mention just three things just now very quickly. How did they respond? Well, first of all, the response is firm. It's firm. Peter and John, they hold their ground. There's no suggestion that they were disrespectful to the authorities, but they were firm. Verse 7, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked them, by what power or by what name have you done this? Now, I suspect, I suspect that if Peter and John had been a bit struggling for the word, careful is the wrong word. Well, if they had gone like this, if they had said, what power is it? Oh, they had, if they had said, well, it's the power of Jehovah, the, the God of Israel, and maybe compared it to the miracles of Elisha and Elijah. You know, I think the matter would have taken an end there. That's not what they said. They're, they're very specific. It's as if they're being given a way out. By what power is it? Just say it's, it's Jehovah's power. No, no. It's, it's Jesus' power. No doubt Peter remembered only too well a previous occasion when he hadn't been firm. And had ended up denying his law. The response is firm. Secondly, the response um, is uh, in verses 11 and 12 is honest. They spent the night in jail. A few weeks before this group of men had passed a death sentence on Jesus and they were well able to do so again. But Peter doesn't spare them. He's so honest with them. He shows them where they were going wrong. He said, you rejected the chief cornerstone. You tried to build. And you, you've left out the main, the main piece of the building. There's a gaping hole, he, Peter says, in your religion. A gaping hole. And it's not even in the roof. It's in the found. But he shows them that it could be put right. In verse 12, and I'm not going to deal with it just now. In verse 12, he tells them to turn to Christ and to trust in him. And you'll find forgiveness of sin. You'll find peace with God. That all your religious activities without Christ cannot ever give you. There is none other name. Maybe someday we'll come back to that verse and just deal with verse 12. But take this much with you, none other name. The response was firm. It was honest. And above all else, it was spirit-led. Verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. Ah, there's the secret. This explains the answers. This explains the firm robustness. This explains it all. And this is what the church needs. To be filled with the spirit. Then we will be robust. Then we will be firm. Then we will be clear. Then we will declare none other name. And this is what you need, Christian friends. And I with you. More and more of this, to be filled with the Spirit, 
But we're not trusting in ourselves and leaning on ourselves and trying as best we can by ourselves. This is what we need. And this is the answer. And it's the answer for the church in this country tonight. The Holy Spirit. The power of the Spirit. That's what changes things. Jesus is the head court's tone of the corner. You try to build without him. Well, are you? Are we? You see, there is your chief cornerstone. Or is there a gaping hole? Where he should be. Well you know what the chief cornerstone is. It's important. You can do without some things. But we can't do without a chief cornerstone. It's got to be the right size. And it's got to be the right shape. And there's none other name. There's only one. So as you build, as you'll build this week, check the foundation. Check that it's in line with the chief cornerstone and that it's there. Or there's none other name. The poet put it like this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust my sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to veil his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant and blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all. My hope and stay on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. God bless his word. Let's pray. Grant that our feet are upon the rock. If they are, help us to live accordingly. And if they're not, guide our feet to the rock out of the soft sand in which there is no foundation. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, Peter there was quoting from Psalm 118. And we're going to sing from it. Psalm 118 and at verse 20. We'll sing four verses down to 26. You notice verse 22, that stone is made head cornerstone, which builders did despise. This is the gate of God. Verse 20.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. Now, 